Most people are familiar with the Roman sword, the gladius. It has become the ultimate symbol of Roman military power. But there are many other items that made the Roman soldier to what it was. For example, worn on the left, the Roman war dagger. It's called the Pugio. And in this video, I'll tell you all about it. We want to thank our sponsor Blinkist. Blinkist is a very useful app for us, because in our daily lives, we don't get around to reading all that we'd like. Blinkist takes thousands of non-fiction books and uses experts to summarize them down to their most essential ideas for you to easily digest with text or audio in just 15 minutes. It's been a great tool for us to explore a wide range of topics from the more than 5,000 titles offered by Blinkist. For example, we were able to listen to Man, the State and War by Kenneth Waltz, where he explains the causes of war. He explores works by both classic political philosophers and modern psychologists to explain war amongst states. We also enjoyed the book Mythology by Edith Hamilton about the fascinating world of Western mythology. With Blinkist, you can submerge yourself in any topic in just a blink of an eye. So check it out now by clicking the description in the link down below and get a seven day free trial. In addition, the first hundred people will get a 25% off full membership. Enjoy. Similarly to the Gladius, the Pugio finds its origins in the Iberian Peninsula, current day Spain and Portugal. During the conquest of these lands by the Romans in the 2nd century BC, Rome got introduced to the local dagger of choice, the so-called biglobular Celt Iberian dagger. The name comes from the round pommel and round knob in the middle of the handle. In time, it got adopted by the Romans, like so many other pieces of weaponry and armor before. The first Roman use of the Celt Iberian dagger is estimated to have been roughly somewhere around 130 BC. From the Iberian Peninsula, the Pugio spread towards the other provinces, with three of the earliest examples found at the archaeological site of the Battle of Alesia in Gaul. Fought in 52 BC under the command of Julius Caesar, it was around the same period that wide-scale adoption of the Pugio really took off. Of all the Pugios found, roughly 80% comes from northwestern Europe, of which most from along the River Rhine, which formed the border of the empire from the first century onwards. But the popularity of the Pugio in Western Europe can also be supported by looking at the tombstones of Roman soldiers from all across the empire. On these tombstones, soldiers had themselves depicted in full gear, thus giving us a great opportunity to make comparisons. And again, when comparing the number of tombstones in a region with Pugio to the number of tombstones without the Pugio, the areas around the River Rhine in North and Central Europe come out as the most dominant places for the Pugio. The gravestones also tell us that the Pugio was born on the left side. The next obvious question is why? Why was the spread of the Pugio so limited to Central and Northern European border provinces? Why was the Pugio so uncommon in Eastern and Southern border provinces? And almost completely absent outside of Europe, in the rest of the Roman Empire, which was huge. Well, like many things in ancient history, we do not know for sure, but there is one compelling theory that we believe is right. The main reason lies in the fact that the Celtic and Germanic peoples of Northern and Central European provinces had a different approach to combat. More so than other cultures, theirs revolved around combat. This, for example, is expressed by them sacrificing weapons to the gods by throwing them in rivers and lakes, also by being buried with their weapons or having trial by combat to name just a few. Their lifestyle was dominated by warfare. They either fought to survive or fought to expand and prosper. For men, fighting was a way of life, a way of showing your worth and earning the respect of others. And what more honorable way to do so than in actual close combat, while looking your opponent in the eye. This mentality was reflected in their army composition, being dominated by plain infantrymen. Unlike many of the other peoples Rome faced across their empire, in Central and Northern Europe, ranged weapons and cavalry played a very minor role on the battlefield. And like the Gauls had experienced before them, the Germanic tribes soon realized the Romans excelled in pitched battles. So the Germanic tribes adopted to a guerrilla style of warfare, using ambush and hit and run attacks. Their attacks could be undertaken by surprise, from multiple angles at the same time, 
or even at night. In such a chaotic environment, the Gladius can be an inconvenient weapon, because effective use requires a focused and straight thrust or a wide swing. The Pouillon, on the other hand, needs little to no space or wind-up to use effectively. The fact that Germanic warriors seldomly wore any body armor adds to the effectiveness of the Pugio. And so, especially when facing the Germanic tribes along the Rhine and Danube, who fought in such a way, the Pugio could be a valuable addition to the armament of a Roman soldier, not just as a backup, but as an actual primary weapon. This idea, that the Pugio can be a primary weapon, is not just speculation, the Roman author Tacitus actually describes a situation that corroborates this. He describes the siege of a Roman camp during the Batavian revolt in 69 AD, when he says, And many who had climbed up on the rampart were pierced by slashes of Pugios. Tacitus could have used any other general description, but instead he chose to specifically mention the Pugio as the used weapon here. This confirms our belief that the Pugio was not just a backup weapon. The Pugio could actually be preferred over the Gladius. The limited geographical spread is not the only thing that's got historians puzzled. Many are also confused about the use and the function of the Pugio. They believe the Pugio was more of a symbolic weapon instead of a practical weapon. Then there are others who think it was more of a utensil, like a boy scout knife or a Swiss pocket knife, used by civilians and soldiers alike. Let me explain to you why we believe they are wrong and the Pugio was purely a militaristic weapon, and a very practical one at that. The reason for some to believe the Pugio was a symbolic weapon lies partly in the strong symbolic value the dagger had in Celtic and Etruscan tradition. It was a symbol of the free man and of power over life and death. Though there are some clues of some symbolic meaning of the Pugio in Roman culture, they are few and faint. Certainly not enough to assume that all Pugios were religiously symbolic and not to be used in combat. Then there is the common misconception that Pugios were common items in Roman civil life. This is derived from accounts in which civilians used Pugio in either assassinations or suicides. The most famous example being the assassination of Julius Caesar, being stabbed to death with Pugios by senators, commemorated on a coin, is showing the cap that symbolized liberty along with two Pugios. The depiction of Pugios on this coin goes to show how accepted the Pugio had become in Roman culture. It was this weapon that liberated the Roman Republic from a tyrant. But these accounts of civilian use of the Pugio always concern politicians or emperors, both of whom would have had extensive military experience because of the so-called cursus honorum or honorary course and the Cursus Honorum started with 10 years of service in the army. So even senators had extensive military experience and were likely familiar with the Pugio. They may have kept it as they retired from the army, as a sort of souvenir. Still, by no means does this make the Pugio a civilian item. This is corroborated by the total lack of Pugios on any depiction of a civilian. Also, we have the treasure that is Pompeii, the Roman town that got buried in ash and magma in the late 1st century AD. In Pompeii, only three Pugios have been found in total, two of which can be connected to gladiators and the third one to a soldier. If the Pugio were really a common civilian item, there would have been found way more in Pompeii or other civilian settings, but there haven't, because the Pugio was a strictly military item, like weapons in general are. The design itself tells us this as well. It is clearly not a kitchen knife. So last but not least, let's have a closer look at the design of the Pugio. The different designs can be classified into three periods. The first, or Republic period. The second, or Imperial period. And the third, or Final period. Some of these Pugios are wooden cutouts, for demonstrative purposes, obviously, but I'll talk you through them. In the beginning, the Pugio was a direct copy of the Celt Iberian dagger. As you can see, the blade was short and narrow, and the pommel was round with a circular knob in the middle of the handle. These were typical characteristics of the Celt Iberian dagger, as I mentioned before. These type of daggers had little to no decoration on the sheath or handle, and most distinctive of this early type of Pugio was the pronounced midriff, running lengthwise 
across the blade. This was presumably for extra strength. This type of Puyo was typical until roughly the end of the first century BC. From the end of the first century BC onwards, the design of Puyo underwent a significant change. In this period, the Puyo became distinctively Roman and found its greatest use in the Roman army. This one here is typical for the beginning of the first century AD. As you can see, the typical round pommel changed to a semicircular shape, and the blade itself cut its recognizable leaf shape form, typical for this era. The length and width of the blade increased slightly. Also typical for this period are the rich decorations on the weapon and sheath. The handle was often made of wood or bone, but with a cover of sheath metal, so that only the sheath metal would be visible. This superficial metal cover could be inlaid with gems and made of precious metals like silver. Some of such pugios have been found and still show the remains of the original exuberant colors of the decorations. This one here has a handle made of ivory, which in itself is a luxury in the decoration. In the second half of the first century AD, a new production method gets adopted, similar to that of the production of the gladius of this time. This method made the production of pugios a lot easier, cheaper and faster. Blades lost their typical leaf shape and generally became straighter and longer. Also, decoration was lessened. Overall, the focus of the design shifted towards a more simple and practical one. All this leads historians to believe that from this period onward, handles similar to that of the gladius became common in Pugios, like this one here, made after an archaeological find near the town of Pompeii, and the similar one is also displayed on a gravestone. The last period of design for Pugios begins somewhere in the first half of the 2nd century AD, and lasts until the end of the 3rd century AD. In this period, Pugios become considerably bigger, with blades of up to 45 cm long and 8 cm wide. These Pugios were stubby and thick, losing all resemblance to the Pugios of old. In ancient literature, the name Semispata appears, literally meaning half-sword. This might very well refer to this kind of Pugio. The Pugio, like this, remained in use until the end of the 3rd century AD, after which the use of the Pugio stops entirely, for reasons yet unknown. With that, the history of the Pugio is complete. What had started out as a foreign weapon had over time evolved into a typically Roman weapon. And unlike what many people believe, the Pugio was much more than just a decorative item. Instead, it was an effective weapon of war, because exactly for that reason, it was adopted in the first place and had become so popular and common in the Roman army. Starting this YouTube channel has been dominating our lives for the past three years, and we have sacrificed so much of our social life and even career for it. For example, this entire weekend will be a weekend of research and script writing, which takes on average about 40 to 80 hours to give an example of just one of the returning chores involved in making such documentaries. But getting the reception like we have, we know it's all gonna be worth it. Because don't think this is it. And this channel is done evolving and improving. We're still only starting out. And we feel like we have what it takes to really make this channel into the best and most spectacular historic YouTube channel out there. But there's still a final leap to make to get to a real professional level, both in terms of quality and in terms of the type of content we create. But to make this last jump, we do need your support as the profits from this channel have been next to nothing until now. So, we have launched a Patreon channel earlier this week, meant as a stable source of income to hopefully cover the continuous costs of running this channel. For the real epic stuff though, we're gonna launch a Kickstarter in May, and the Kickstarter will be aimed at financing the stuff history geeks like us dream of. Think of slow motion weapon tests, functioning Roman artillery, detailed on-site documentaries on, for example, Hadrian's Wall or the siege of Masada in Israel. Really, whatever the budget allows us to do, we will do. And the best part is, you can decide what it is we should do. Because our Patreon members and Kickstarter backers will get to decide. The Kickstarter page is live as a pre-launch page now. 
meaning there's just a single button that will register you to be notified on launch. And if you consider backing us, please make use of this function because it will inform us about the number of likely backers, which is important to us because we will be creating all sorts of cool physical rewards to give to the backers. Now, that's all. Please consider supporting us as we really do need it. Thank you.